Good morning, good evening, happy Sunday. A day before the Lord that we worship. Each day is a day of worship. I trust you are keeping your eyes on him, I truly do. Uh, it's been a difficult couple of weeks, it's been a difficult couple of months, it's been a difficult couple of, uh, uh, a full, almost a full year. And will we be back in the swing of things or back to some type of a normal uh, by March? which is when all of this started. Um, disruptions can cause a lot of bumps in the road, uh, not only in our minds, but overall in all of in our lives as well. It's, it can be difficult, but again, if you have the Lord in your life, nothing, nothing should prevent you from putting a smile on your face and giving you peace and hope. We're in the book of Exodus today. Exodus chapter 10 to be exact, and we're looking at the eighth plague. Ten plagues. I cannot even begin to imagine what was going on in the hearts and the minds of Egypt, Pharaoh, as well as the hearts and the minds of the Israelites as they uh, just watched everything unfold, the power of God. And that power can, can represent so much of who God is and what we today even can recognize and realize and and again as we go through this this pandemic to realize what that power means and we'll look a little bit about that today but let's begin shall we Exodus chapter 10 beginning in verse 1 it says now the Lord said to Moses go into Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants that I may show these signs of mine before him and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty thing I have done in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. I got to tell you, as I was uh, doing my, my study, my preparation for this over the last week, that one phrase at the very beginning in verse 1 that says, For I have hardened his heart, kind of just made me stop and go, God hardened Pharaoh's heart? I, that doesn't, are, are we robots? Can he just simply touch and make us stubborn and arrogant? And so as I just started doing my research and building and putting this, this presentation, this study together, it had always troubled me as a believer. And I decided to put a little bit more um, investigation into it and I came up with some interesting thoughts and insights first and foremost I am a strong believer in free will and at the very beginning of, of um, Genesis and I, I have some verses here Genesis chapter 2 16 and 17 it says and the Lord God commanded the man that's talking about Adam right from the very beginning saying you may surely eat of every tree of the garden but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat but for in that day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. He, again, we're demonstrating free will. You have a choice, a choice that you need to make. Was God telling Pharaoh he didn't have a choice? He's basically telling him, you're not going to worship me? And again, that bothered me. As I was doing more of my research, uh, Genesis is in the beginning. Joshua, The book of Joshua comes after Exodus here with Moses. Joshua was the leader after Moses. And this is what Joshua says. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in which land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, a choice is made. Again, the concept of free will. And I, I was really bothered by this and that God and God his whim can just say done. But as I researched it more and more, this is something else I found. It says, for, this comes out of Romans, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that, the, that people are without excuse. Now, the God I know, who I have a real personal relationship and have for the past 30 years, 
and like to believe that I've grown in his grace and mercy, he is a God of second and third and fourth chances. He's a God full of grace, mercy. He's a God full of love. And to suddenly say done with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's a, a part of his creation, Pharaoh can say at the, at the judgment day, well, you hardened my heart. And all those questions and all those thoughts were just turning him inside of me. And I, I, I needed to know what this meant, that God hardened his heart. Do you know that throughout the book of, well, I'm sorry, throughout the plagues that it says 10 times from the beginning of the plagues to the end that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And it also says 10 times that God hardened his heart. And it doesn't say God hardened his heart until the sixth plague. Is that where the cutoff was? Is that where God said done? I've got to believe with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength that till my last breath, God is going to give me an opportunity to come to him in a real personal way through his son, Jesus Christ. Pharaoh was a real man. As I studied more and more, again, looking up verses to, to counter and to, 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 to see that God doesn't contradict himself, uh, this was an, another verse I came across. It comes out of Proverbs 16. It says, in the heart, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. So could we say that Pharaoh's heart I mean, obviously his ego was in the way and his pride. Remember, he was considered a god. So that in and of himself, he's thinking that uh, the, the Hebrew uh, god is inferior to me. Is that that's part of it? Is that the part of Pharaoh hardening his heart? And where does the god hardening come into play? And this, I guess, could be part of it that he establishes their steps. And then why is God establishing man's steps in the fact that he still has a free will? I also know my God wishes no man to perish. I, I believe I read that. I also know that it says he establishes their steps. So if he wishes no man to perish and establishes their steps, is he constantly trying to reveal himself to all of mankind in multiple, in, in innu innumerable ways to get man's attention? Remember, man's not looking for God. God loves us so much, each and every day he reveals himself in some sort of way. Whether the heavens declare the glory of God, or whether it's another individual, whether it's his word of God today, or whatever it may be, God is, is without being tired, continuously pursuing man. That's the God we know. That's the God I know. And looking at all this, I can say I, he's obviously... Putting these, like a road has roadblocks, uh, determining the steps of Pharaoh, he's putting these revelations or these roadblocks in front of Pharaoh to say, Pharaoh, do you not realize, first of all, my power? It says that I may show these signs and, and mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty things I have done. His power, his, his sovereignty, his supremacy, and more than just that, his love and his hatred of sin. He desires Pharaoh and all of man to come to him. So this hardening God's heart, is it his revelation of himself to Pharaoh? And I believe Josh in the last couple of days, as well as Pastor Andrew, talked a little bit about the, the hardening of the heart and that it's either... Uh, how you harden yourself or you honor God, I think is what Pastor Andrew said, which was a beautiful illustration. And what that basically tells me, and I hope it, it relates to you, is that as God reveals himself, in such cases as his mighty signs and wonders, how do we as individuals respond? So it's not the revealer that's hardening the heart, it's the receiver and how he's taking it in or not taking it in. I, I once read something that said, um, the sun that shines here across this earth can soften wax, but this, that same sun can also harden clay. Again, 
the sun revealing itself to these various different elements and how they react and respond to it. So could we not say that uh, I have hardened his heart by revealing myself to Pharaoh? And I can, I can understand that a lot better than God just saying, done. God doesn't operate like that, at least not with me. He has bestowed continuously long-suffering and patience with me. He has shown so much mercy, and he has guided my steps. And as I said, I have my free choice and my free will of what direction I want to go, but God has always rerouted me or bent me this way or, or done that to say, I've got a plan. I've got a plan for all mankind, and I've got a plan for you to be part of it. So here we see God revealing himself not only to Pharaoh, not only to his, the servants of Egypt, but also to the Israelites and you and I through this reading, exposing himself in another wondrous way. So much so that he says so that you may tell it to your sons who I am and what I've done. Pretty incredible. And we see the long-suffering of God because we're on plague number eight. And this is how it reads. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse? I've revealed myself to you. How long will you continue to, as Paul used to say, kick against the pricks? How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me, or else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth, so that no one will be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen since the day they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. I ask myself and I ask you, how long will we continue to kick against the pricks as God reveals himself to us in miraculous ways? This pandemic is, is a beautiful illustration. And I'm not saying God is, uh, is mean-spirited and, and wants to inflict pain upon us, but just like this, look, is, is he trying to get our attention that much more? Does he want us to humble ourselves before him and say, God, I can't do it on my own strength. I humble myself before you. I need your wisdom. I need your grace. I need your hope. Pharaoh is not, is refusing this. It, we go on to read in verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the man go that they may serve the Lord their God and do not yet know that the Egypt is destroyed. The servants are starting to say, oh, we're in a bad situation here. Um, yeah, we have gods, but the Hebrew God is obviously much more powerful than our gods. And he's destroying Egypt. He's destroying uh, the food supply. He's destroying the economy. He's destroyed every aspect of what we know. And What's really interesting, remember, Pharaoh is perceived as a god. So for these, these servants to address him, they're in dire straits. They're willing to confront Pharaoh now to say, we need to put our attention to the Hebrew god. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, go serve the Lord your god. Who are the ones that are going? So, okay, let's negotiate here. And again, in his arrogant voice, I'm sure he's saying, and Moses said, we will go with our young and our old and our sons and our daughters with our flocks and our herds, we will go. For we must hold a feast to the Lord. So he's saying, we're all leaving. That's the plan. Then he, Pharaoh said, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. In other words, he's saying, your God better be as powerful as he says he is because I ain't letting you guys go. Uh, you're you're tricking me. Your your intent is to not come back. I mean, he's 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 saying the servant said, "Let the men go," because the men aren't going to leave their wives and children behind. And Pharaoh is trying to negotiate not with Moses, basically with God. Um, not so, verse eleven. Go now, 
you who are men and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. In other words, they dragged Pharaoh, I'm sorry, they dragged Moses out. He is, he is just, again, as God continues to reveal who he is, his, his love, his hatred of sin, his power, his miracles, his supremacy, his sovereignty, his, his God is the only true and living God. Pharaoh is just getting angrier and angrier and angrier. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the, for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail was left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and the, they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Up in, uh, I'm from up north, and I don't know if it comes down here in Florida, and I don't know if it comes in your country, but there's a, something called a katydid. And they come out like every 17 years. And when they come out, I mean, they're, they're everywhere, and the noise and sound of them is unbelievable. But this is nothing compared to those type of locusts. Now, the Middle East is very familiar with locusts. Usually they're about three inches long. They're gr grasshoppers, basically, with double wings, and they fly. I mean, they, they are, can be so countless in number, literally in the billions, that just as in this particular case, they cover the sky for miles that you can't even see the sun. I mean, it's a, it's a known fact that that's what lo these locusts do. Um, there's nothing to stop them. I mean, fire can't stop them, ri rivers, ravines, nothing can stop these things. And they're like, their appetite is endless. They will literally devour anything. And here we're told, there's nothing like what I just described that you'll ever know before or after. Quite amazing. Let me read something out of Joel real quick for you. Joel was way hundreds of years later after Israel has established themselves as a nation, and yet they fell from God. And Joel the prophet says this at the very opening. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Sounds very similar to this. What the chewing locust had and the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten, and what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you junkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has led, led waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. He goes on to say, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Joel used an illustration similar to this to describe the revelation of God. God now is describing this his power, his revelation to Pharaoh and the servants, and again to Moses and the people of Israel. Pharaoh starts to see it, he recognizes it, but his ego continues to get in the way. For he says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. Again, showing that this was just not coincidental. God predicted it would happen. It happened when it happened. It happened instantaneously when Moses, with his staff or whatever, the hand of God was revealing himself to all of Egypt. 
And just as now he revealed the locust coming in, he reveals the locust now going away and says, not one was left. Only God can do something like that. But the last verse, the last verse 20 of chapter 10 in Exodus says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the children of Israel go. God revealed his, his, his himself. Even when he revealed Jesus 2,000 years ago, man in their anger wanted him dead. God did not harden their hearts, the Pharisees' hearts at that time. God is simply throughout time and history, as it says, without excuse for, for since the creation of the world, Romans 1.20, He's been revealing himself to you and me, to the people who walked before us, to the people who will walk after us. God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever chooses to believe shall be saved. We harden our own heart, not God. We harden our own heart because we don't want to believe the truth. We don't want to uh, accept and humble ourselves before a God who is far mightier, second to none, but with that, wants that real personal relationship with us. Have you chosen Jesus Christ, the way back to God, as your personal Lord and Savior? I read out of Joel. Joel is, the, the, again, was a prophecy against Israel. We all seem to mess up. Pharaoh messes up, Israel messes up, we mess up. And in that description of the locust, as we read with Pharaoh, he mentions the day of the Lord. And what's really quite interesting in Revelation, the day of the Lord is also spoken of. God also in his supremacy, in his revelation, gives us warning. That's who God is. And he's warning you and me now. He's given us stuff like the sons and daughters could, could remember from the past, but he's also telling us the future. Judgment day is coming. This earth as we know it will not only exist. When is that? Only God knows the time, the season, the hour. It could be tomorrow. You could die tomorrow. Don't harden your heart to a God who is revealing himself to you. You seek him out. He'll reveal himself even more. Go to God today. Worship him. Thank him. Repent. Humble yourself. And put joy in your heart. Let him put peace in your heart in a situation as a pandemic, as a plague of locusts, can see and get you through it. And you will glorify him and worship him that much more. God bless you. Precious Lord, I lift up our listening audience to you. May your word speak and reveal who you are in so many different attributes and characteristics of how much you love us and care for us. We give you the honor and praise, dear Lord, and thank you for saving us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great and God-centered day. In Jesus' name, be encouraged.